But if you would, turn over to chapter 4, and now I'd like you to notice verses 7 and 8. And really, this whole passage goes together. It's about 25 verses long. It's all of 2 Timothy chapter 3. There's 17 verses there. But the thought continues into chapter 4, down through verse number 8. So we're looking at the beginning of it, chapter 3, verse 1. We're looking at the end of it, chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Notice what it says in, in verse 7 and 8. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto them, all them also, that love his appearing. So in the beginning, chapter 3, verse number 1, Paul was warning Timothy, perilous days are ahead. You better buckle your seatbelt. In chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, Paul is concluding it. He says, Timothy, I want you to know something. In the perilous times, in these last days, I fought my fight. I kept the faith. I ran my race to its extent, to its fullest. Now I'm getting ready to leave the scene. God's going to take me home. But there is a crown of righteousness that is laid up for me. He says in verse number 8, that first word there, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Based on the idea that in these perilous times, these perilous days, I fought my fight, I kept the faith, I ran my race. Now, what you have from chapter 3, verse 1, all the way through that chapter, and the beginning verses of chapter 4, is Paul's encouragement to Timothy, here's what you need to do in the perilous days. If you want to finish your course, if you want to run your race, and you want to keep the faith, if you want to reach the end of the race and find that there is a crown of righteousness awaiting you also, <coughs> There are three succinct, clear statements that Paul gives Timothy. And he's saying, Timothy, if you will do these three things, you too will enjoy the crown of righteousness that will await you. It's, it's critical that you and I understand that that is the end message. It's not that Paul is trying to get Timothy to be charismatic and be able to draw large crowds of people and large masses of people that he's wanting Timothy to have a long, satisfying, exciting, wonderful, joyful life. The end message is, if you want to be able to stand before Jesus Christ and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, here is your crown of righteousness for fighting your fight and running your course and doing it in perilous times, then you've got to do these three, these three items or you're not going to make it. I'll tell you what the three items are. Number one, Paul will say you need to keep doing the right things. Timothy, you need to keep doing the right things. Number two, you need to proclaim the word of God to others. And number three, don't be half-hearted in living for God. Don't do it with half your heart. Live for God with your whole heart. Those are the three items. Now, Paul realized that Timothy was a young man. And there was a danger here that in the perilous times, things would be so difficult that one, Timothy may compromise his life. He may sell himself out. He may not want to preach and use the word hell or damnation. He may not want to preach against sin. He may not want to preach and tell people they need to repent. He may soften his message. He may compromise some of his convictions. He may compromise some of his standards. That these would be perilous times and that young preacher would be put under the, the pressure cooker and he would soften the message. He would change the message. He would sell it out to some. Timothy, it's perilous times. Don't soften your message. If you want to get to the end of the road and hear, well done. If you want to receive your crown of righteousness. Not only was Paul concerned that Timothy may soften the message, obviously there would be concern that Timothy, because people would despise his youth, let no man despise thy youth, maybe he would just quit altogether. Do you realize that there's that same 
concern that we have in Christianity today to where rather than you and I living with biblical standards, living with biblical convictions, well, we're in the 21st century, and people will think I'm, I'm kind of freakish. They'll think that I'm, I'm puritanical. They'll, they'll, they'll think badly of me, and we start worrying and being concerned about uh, people's uh, opinions of us. And we compromise. And not only do we have that danger, there's a lot of Christians who just flat out quit. The Christian life is just too hard. I tried doing all of that stuff. I tried being faithful. I tried singing in the choir. I tried teaching a class. I tried being faithful in church. I tried reading through the Bible in a year. I tried having a prayer journal. I tried, and they quit. So the same dangers that Paul was concerned with with Timothy are the same dangers that you and I need to be concerned about as well. Amen. And the times have grown more perilous since Timothy's day. Now, Paul is co conveying this message to Timothy, and it's really on his heart. As you read through this, this letter, 2 Timothy, that's one of the items that is striking, is that this is... This is large on Paul's heart that he wants to express this <coughs> to Timothy. And there's a couple of reasons why I realize that. Uh, one reason you see is in, in chapter 4 and verse number 1. Look at chapter 4 and verse number 1. Paul says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is giving Timothy a charge. That's how big it is on Paul's heart. I'm charging you. I'm commissioning you with this. I want to instill this in you. Timothy, I charge you with this. That's one of the evidences I see that this is dear to the heart of Paul. And that he wants to challenge Timothy with it. You see it also in chapter 4 and verse number 7. In the words that Paul says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He's conveying to Timothy, I'm wrapping it up. This is the end. And these are my last, some of my last words to you. My life is concluding, and now I want you to be able to fight a good fight. I want you to finish the course. There's one other evidence here that makes you and I realize or calls our attention to how important this is to Paul. And you see it in chapter 3 and verse number 1 when Paul writes, This know also that in the last day a perilous time shall come. Now I'm not a grammarian and I can't explain the, the clauses and the conjunctions and uh, the other particles of speech, articles of speech. But do you realize that chapter 3 and verse number 1 could have just started out as in the last days perilous time shall come? But Paul doesn't start like that. He starts with, this know also. It's, it's pausing. It's calling attention to. It's as if, as a father, I'm saying to my child, now listen up. I really want you to hear this. I want you to know this also. Rather than just saying the item that I want them to know, I'm pausing and I'm calling attention to it. So this is really critical to the heart of Paul that he impresses this upon Timothy. <clears throat> He's alerting Timothy to the idea that perilous times are ahead and Timothy better be ready for what lay up the road. That word perilous means dangerous, <clears throat> full of risks. And there's a warning here for all Christians. We too are living in <clears throat> perilous times and if we're not properly prepared, we'll lose heart, we'll grow faint or weary, will either compromise or will quit. A question can be asked at this point, what makes the times so perilous? Paul says, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. What makes the days so perilous? Well, Paul takes a couple of verses to explain that to Timothy. And you see it in, in chapter 3, at verse number 2. Chapter 3, verse number 2. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, and it goes on. In reality, when you count them, 
in verses 2, 3, and 4, and the other verses, there are 19 <coughs> characteristics of the men in these last days. 19 characteristics. It's a list that you and I are able to look at and say, boy, do I fit any of those characteristics? I don't want those to be a part of my life. But the first one that he mentions in verse number two, men shall be lovers of their own selves. Do you know why Saddam Hussein was such a beast and such a monster? Because he was a lover of his own self. Dictators are. Do you know why the, the Mussolinis and the Adolf Hitlers were such wicked despots? It's because they were lovers of their own selves. And it leads to the next items that you see in the verses. When a person is a lover of their own self, it's obviously that they're going to be covetous. And then it only stands to reason that they're going to be boasters, that they're going to be proud. Those things just fall in line with being a lover of one's own self. And that is what is going to... Those 19 characteristics that you read in those verses that will make the times so perilous. The Bible says we're not supposed to be lovers of our own selves. We're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. We're supposed to love God with our whole heart, soul, life, strength, our whole being. But you see, when we're lovers of our own selves, it contributes to that idea of the times being perilous. One of the reasons the times would be perilous is because men will be in love with themselves. Another reason you'll see in chapter 3 and verse 6. Chapter 3 and verse number 6, this is another contributing factor to the perilous times. It says, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Not only because men are lovers of themselves, but because women are silly and lustful. Silly and lustful. I've got to have that purse. I've got to have that handbag. I've got to have what I saw on TV. I have to have what the neighbor has. I have to have this, this, uh, this occupation. I have to have this credential. I have to have this my standing in society. Wherever my friends are at on, on the ladders of successes and in their careers, I need to be on an equal plane if not higher. And it's, it's, it's blatantly obvious when you see magazines like Seventeen Magazine and, and some of the other ones that, that cater to the, the lusts of, and desires of women. They want to have their makeup like this Hollywood person and they want uh, this dress like that person there and, and uh, the list goes on and on. But it, it, that's just a, the, the fruit of the root. And the root is that the women are silly. Silly women laden with sins. You see, Proverbs draws a contrast, the antithesis of the silly woman, when it speaks of the wise woman. What makes the times so perilous? The times are perilous because men will be lovers of their own selves and the other 18 things that are listed in that catalog. The times will be perilous because the women will be silly, foolish women. And we want to learn the opposite of that when we read through Proverbs. And Proverbs instructs us about the wise woman, the woman of discretion. But I want to get more specific because there are three statements that Paul gives Timothy to help him navigate through this very difficult of times, these perilous times. Those three statements again are number one, Timothy, keep doing the right things. That's first of all what you and I have to learn. Keep doing the right things. When you read through all of these 25 verses, chapter 3 verses 1 through 17, chapter 4 verses 1 through 8, it fast, it's fascinating that there are three clear statements that Paul says to Timothy, here's what you need to do. There's not five, there's not two, there's three. And you and I are able to observe that, Timothy, if you do these, then you're going to be able to say like the Apostle Paul said in verse number 8, henceforth there is a crown of righteousness awaiting me that the Lord is going to give me. Number one, keep doing the right things. You'll see it in chapter 3 and verse number 14 and 15. Chapter 3, verse number 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise of the salvation 
through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Do you see that? Verse 14, Timothy, continue thou the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. Keep doing the right things. How are you going to navigate and negotiate through these perilous waters, these days and these times, full of wicked men and evil women? Keep doing the right things. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. All you need to remember here with this point, this will simplify it, is who, the what, and the who. They're there in verses 14 and 15. That's the simplicity of it. If you and I want to get this point nailed down in our life, we need to things. We need to remember the who, the what, and the who. Let me give you the first who. Take a peek at chapter 1 and verse 5. Chapter 1 and verse number 5. He says, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. You see that there in uh, verse number 5. In thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice. He said in chapter 3, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. Do you know where he learned them? from his grandmother and his mother. Keep doing the right things. One of the who's that you and I are supposed to be learning from is mom and dad. Mom and dad. We may not all have the same privilege that Timothy had with his mother and grandmother. But I would like to think if you don't, you have a motherly figure or a fatherly figure in your life that you can reap the same benefits from. Paul is saying to Timothy, continue down the things which you learned when you were at home. If you're going to get through these perilous times, keep doing the things that were instilled in you when you were a little boy, when you were a young man, when you were a teenager. There were, there were right things that your mom and dad did. There were wrong things that your mom and dad did. Throw the wrong things out, but the right things, the profitable things, the helpful things, those things, hold on to. I want you to notice here in chapter 1, look at verse number 13. Verse number 13. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Not only did Timothy have the benefit of his mother and his grandmother, Paul says, continue thou the things which you have learned from your mother and your grandmother, and in chapter 1 and verse 13, that you have heard of me that you've heard from me. Continue thou in those things. So he's giving him specific examples that he can benefit from. That is the who. You have your mother. You have your grandmother. You have uh, me, the apostle. For us, this is our parents. We can include in this our teachers. Your Sunday school teacher. Continue thou in the things which you have learned from your Sunday school teachers. Well, that's kind of hard. I won't come to Sunday school. That's between you and God. But you have that privilege. Continue thou in those things which you have heard and which you have learned. It could be those people that you esteem as, as your parents. Maybe you didn't have the ideal mother. You didn't have the ideal father. I know there's a lot like that, that they just... There's rage and hurt and bitterness when they think of a mother and father. That's, that's not what we're talking about. But, but somebody that you can respect and honor and esteem in that role. Also your teachers, pastors, missionaries, youth pastors. It also, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. It, I, I, I threw in the mix, I, I, I'll say elders. Your elders. And when I say elders, I mean, for me, Mr. and Mrs. Batten. I mean, Margie Knights. I mean, Tom Fields and Harold and Eileen Copen. I mean, Ralph and Lois Strong and Brother and Mrs. McLemore. To, to, to watch their life, they're not perfect examples. You don't know. I don't need to know. They'll tell you they're not perfect. They'll tell you. These are the mistakes that I've made in life. 
That's exactly what we're talking about. We're not setting them up on a pedestal and saying, all oh, these people are perfect. We're saying that they can pay it backward and say, here's, here's what I did in life. Here's some of the really smart things I did, and God blessed it. And here's some of the really dumb things I did, and I regretted it. You have your teachers. You have, you have your seniors that are around you, your seniors. <coughs> Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. Keep doing the right things. That's the first who there. Then there's the one. Turn with me back to chapter 3. I told you you need to know for this point here the who, the what, and the who. The first two, he talked about your mother and grandmother and the Apostle Paul. That's our parents, our teachers, our uh, seniors that are around us, that we are junior to. The next one is the scriptures. That's the what. And you see that in verse number 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. Timothy, keep doing the right things. How do I know the right thing to do? It was instilled in you by your mother and your grandmother. You heard me teaching you these things. Mm. Continue those things. How else do I know the right things to do? You have the scriptures. The holy scriptures that you knew from your childhood because your mother taught you when you were a child. Man. You have the scriptures. How do we negotiate through the perilous times in which you and I live? We have the who and we have the what. We have the scriptures. We need to search the scriptures. We need to read the Bible. We need to study the Word of God. Man. We need to find its applications and then apply them personally to our lives so that we can keep doing the right things. We had the who and the what. Now here's the other who, and that's a capital W, because you'll see it there in verse number 15. From a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. That is the other who. How do I keep doing the right things? You have the model and the example of Jesus Christ and you have him helping you, enabling you, aiding you. When, Timothy, you feel like you cannot make it in the perilous times, you're scared, or you feel like shrinking back in your faith, or you feel like throwing in the towel and quitting, cry out to the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask Him for strength. Ask Him for help. Ask Him for direction and guidance. Ask Him for the things that you need. You have the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep doing the right things. Keep praying. Keep in church. Keep reading your Bible. Keep on, Timothy. Keep doing the right things. Yeah. Number two... Number two, proclaim the word of God to others. If you want to make it through these perilous times and get to chapter 4 and verse 8, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Timothy, you need to keep proclaiming the word of God mm. to others. I thought it was ironic as I was pulling this together because it fits perfectly with our theme. The word of God was published throughout the region. If you and I want to navigate through the perilous times, we've got to carry that out. Amen. It doesn't seem to make sense initially, but when you think about it, it all comes together. We are establishing this. The second statement that Paul tells Timothy is you need to proclaim the word of God to others. Well, how is that going to help me get through perilous times, preacher? We've missed the point. It's not so much that we're trying to get through the perilous times. We're trying to get to chapter 4, verse number 8, where Jesus says, Well done. Here's your crown of righteousness. Thank you. And if that is going to occur, then we do have to do that. That's right. We have to do number 2. You'll see it clearly in the next statement. There's all kinds of description where Paul says, Timothy, here's perilous men. And Timothy, here's perilous women. And here's John A's and John Ray's. They were examples of uh, wicked men. And, and you knew the example that I gave you. But there are just three clear statements. Here's the second statement. You see it in chapter 4 and verse number 2. He had already said in verse 1, I charge you. And here's the charge with verse number two. Preach the word. 
Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That is the clear second statement that Paul gives Timothy. If you want that, henceforth there is laid up for you a crown of righteousness. When you are done fighting your fight and running your race and keeping your faith, then you have to do chapter 4 and verse 2. You have to preach the word. You may not be a pastor in a pulpit. You may not be a preacher in a church. You may not be a missionary on a foreign field or uh, around this country. You may not be a Sunday school teacher. But that doesn't excuse any one of us. Preach it, brother. You preach the word. Amen. You preach the word. You take the scriptures, you take the word of God, and you say, you know, I once was lost in sin. And I was blind, spiritually blind. I was deaf, spiritually deaf. I couldn't hear the things of God. I couldn't see the things of God. And then one day somebody told me that I needed a Savior. And if I would humble myself before Him and cry out to Him, asking Him to forgive me, praying to Him and saying, would you please save me, that He would hear that prayer. And I prayed that Jesus did hear that prayer and He answered it. And now my eyes are open. And now my ears can hear and I can see more clearly. And, and the Spirit of God is dwelling within me. And I just want to share that message with you. It doesn't need to be a preacher in the pulpit. It doesn't need to be a missionary on the field. But all of us, all of us, if we want chapter 4 and verse number 8, if we want to be able to navigate through the perilous times and have the same conclusion that Paul did where he was able to delightfully, joyfully proclaim, I fought my fight, I finished my course, I kept the faith. I didn't sell out, I didn't compromise, I didn't quit, and as a result, now God is going to say to me, well done, henceforth here's the crown of righteousness that awaits you, enter in and enjoy. If we want that, we need to preach the word. We need to proclaim, publish the word of God. In season, out of season. What that means is there's going to be times when it's very convenient, and then there's going to be times when it's very inconvenient, and we don't feel like it. There's going to be times when not only are we dealing with people out there that have road rage, sometimes it's us that have road rage. And we'd rather slam somebody's car into the side of the building than give them a track and tell them about Jesus Christ. Do you know the Lord? Are you ready to meet him? Because I'm ready to introduce you. That's not what we mean by introducing somebody to the Savior. <coughs> In season, out of season. It's times when we feel like it, and boy, we're just packed full with the Spirit of God, filled with the Spirit. And then there's times when we are stubbed our toe, and the dog bit our other foot, we're just as mad as hornets, whatever. In season, out of season. And that we would utilize any means possible. It may be our testimony. It may be giving out a gospel track. It, it may be inviting somebody to come to church with us so that they can hear the gospel. Whatever it might be, we're letting our light shine. We're being a witness. We're being a testimony. I want you to see something with, with this. Look at the end result there in, in verse 3 and 4. It says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. That just stunned me for a few moments. I'm thinking to myself, Paul is telling Timothy, go out and proclaim the word. And I can see Timothy saying, okay, there's the secret. I go out and preach the word and people are going to flood into church and get saved. Hmm. And Paul's like... Timothy, no, you're missing the end point. The end point isn't that you and I go out and preach the word so that we're packing out our auditorium. Wrong motive. Amen. And that's not what Paul is saying in chapter 4, verse number 8. Henceforth, Timothy, you're going to pack out your church. Henceforth, Timothy, you're going to, people are going to love you and give you a lot of attaboys. No. Timothy, preach the word. They're going to turn away their ears from the truth. They're going to believe a lie. And they're not going to come and hear you. <coughs> it's not going to be any of that. But that's not why I'm telling you to do this. I'm telling you to do this in perilous times. 
so that when you stand before your Savior, you can say, I fought my fight. I finished my course, and I did what I was called on to do. We proclaim the word of God to others in season, out of season. Then there's a third very clear statement, third succinct statement that Paul tells Timothy, and that is, do not be half-hearted in living for Christ. Don't be half-hearted in living for Christ. And you'll see the statement clearly in verse chapter 4, verse number 5. It's the next statement that Paul tells Timothy clearly. He says, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. There's like four very plain statements in that verse that Paul is telling Timothy. But when you look at the vocabulary words, you see that he's, he's beseeching Timothy, do it wholeheartedly. Do it 100%. Don't do it 75% or 50%. Wholeheartedly. Look again at verse 5 and, and see some of the key words there. Watch thou in a lot of the things. Timothy, in most of the things, be watchful. Be on guard. Be diligent in most things. No, he says, but watch thou in all things. When you're alone, be watchful. When you think nobody else is seeing, the all seeing eye of God is beholding you. Be watchful. Be watchful. Watch in all things. Look further what it says in verse number five. Endure <coughs> afflictions. You see, when we start getting underneath afflictions and obstacles and trials, we don't want to live all out for God. That's for the missionary. He's the one that has to suffer. He's the one that has to take his lungs. He's the one that has to make sacrifices. I don't want to make sacrifices. It's uncomfortable. No, that's living half-hearted for the Lord. Endure afflictions. You see it further in verse number 5. Do the work of an evangelist. Wait a second. The Christian life is work? I thought it was supposed to be all fun and joy and rosy feelings. No, it's work. Amen. It's work. That's, uh, if, if we want to live half-hearted for the Lord, yeah, we're not, we're not going to get any spiritual calluses on our hands. We'll have a very comfortable Christian life. We'll never be uncomfortable. It'll never be an inconvenience to us. Oh, I, 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 can't, can't, I can't go to those services. It's just an inconvenience. You don't know how busy I am. I, okay, all right. Okay. Don't inconvenience yourself. I can't pick anybody up and bring them to the services. It's, it's, I, I have to drive uh, a mile and a half out of my way. Okay. All right. The Lord God went thousands of miles out of his way to come down from heaven. Amen. Calvary, but will not inconvenience you. You see it there in the terms of verse number five. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Not half proof. Full proof. That's why I say it's in, in, in this statement that Paul gives, Timothy, don't be half-hearted for the Lord. Be 100%. Be fully out for Him. He says very clearly, in all things, do this. Don't allow afflictions to cause you to quit. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of your ministry. You realize that in Christianity, there are a lot of people that are not 100% all out. For God. It's just whatever is convenient. They let convenience determine how and when they're going to serve the Lord. Not what the Lord wants them to do, but what is convenient for me. God says, I want you to be all out for me. I want you to be 100% full proof of your ministry. Paul gives him the, Timothy the example, and he says, Hey, I fought my fight. I didn't quit halfway through the fight. If there were three rounds, I didn't just fight two rounds. I fought all the rounds. I finished my course. If it was a 500 meter race, I ran all 500 meters. I lived my Christian life to its fullest extent. I would think, I would like to think that if God has gifted people with a singing voice that they would use that gift for the Lord. 
I would like to think that if God had enabled or gifted people to play a musical instrument, then they would play that musical instrument for the Lord. I would like to think that if God had gifted you and me to be able to teach little boys and little girls about Jesus, that we would say, hey, I want to fill that calling up in my life. I wouldn't want to get to heaven and have the Lord say, boy, I have all of this potential for you. There were 3,000 people that you could have guided to heaven. And you guided 19. For whatever. You had all of this full potential in your life, and you didn't live up to that full potential. I think one of the most tragic examples of that was Samson. Do you realize what Samson could have done for God? But instead of being an eagle and soaring for the Lord God, he was a turkey gobbling around and down on the ground, fooling around. And you know Christianity is full of that. God giving people so much potential, and it just goes untapped in their life. Things that they could have done. Things that they should have done. And they don't run their course they don't fight their fight, and they're not going to enjoy chapter 4 and verse number 8. And support them. They'll be in heaven. We're not talking salvation or whether or not we're in heaven. We're talking about the crown of righteousness and when the Lord says, well done, my good faithful servant. Here's your crown of righteousness. You fought your fight. You ran your course. You kept the faith. You did what I called you to do. Paul wanted Timothy to realize, Timothy, it's not, the, the end isn't for, so that you can survive perilous times. The idea, Timothy, that I'm passing this down to you isn't so that you pack out the church at Ephesus or wherever it is that Timothy is pastoring. Paul says, as a matter of fact, the opposite is going to happen. Your message isn't going to be popular. People are, are going to listen to the false teachers instead of listening to you. I want you to be able to hear well done. So that you can get through the perilous times and you will have fought your fight well. And it's the same for you and me. Those three statements ring true. Keep doing the right things. Proclaim the word of God to others. And be all out for Jesus Christ. Don't, don't live your Christian life half-heartedly for the Lord.